Good evening. Welcome to the Tuesday, January 14th, 2020 board meeting. Uh, the board has been in closed session since 5.30 for items listed on the agenda. We have all seven board members present, and at this time we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so tonight we have a couple recognitions, and the first one is the Illinois Music Educators Association Junior Selectees. So if all of those students who are one of those being honored, if you could come up and stand in the middle, and also their teachers could come over and do the introduction. Is there a teacher? Come on. So, yeah, just stand in the middle and then face that, yeah. And there might not be a teacher, so you might be it. Is there a proclamation? Yeah, Bev's got it. I guess I am speaking tonight. <laughs> Good thing I came prepared. <laughs> All right, well, uh, you're gonna hear the official proclamation in just a moment, and so you'll get all the students' names then. I don't have that in front of me now, but my name is Patrick Baker. I'm the Fine and Performing Arts Coordinator for the district, so thank you all for coming here tonight to support our amazing students. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be here tonight, so thank you for that. Um, the Illinois Music Education Association involves students from across Illinois and in our district. It involves students from Chicago as well as the west and southwestern suburbs. Over 75 schools were represented, and these students here before you prepared for, successfully completed a rigorous audition in order to be accepted into one of these highly selective ensembles. Um, we commend them for their tenacious work ethic and their commitment to artistry. Each of them has done an excellent job representing themselves, their ensemble, their school, District 205, and the entire Elmhurst community. So on behalf of myself, the middle school music team whose names you're about to hear, as well as Kim Lambert Hack, Megan LaRush, Hillary Butler, who support those teachers, and our elementary music team, we extend our proudest congratulations to each and every one of you. Finally, thanks to the board, to our administration, both district and building, and to our parents, friends, and community members who continue to support music education here in Elmhurst. Thank you all so much, and have a wonderful evening. Good afternoon, students. Good afternoon, parents and families. This is indeed, and I always say it, <clears throat> And it's always so true. This is indeed the best part of every meeting. It is a chance to recognize and honor our students who are doing such amazing things and have so much amazing potential that you'll continue to capture that. So this is our way in the board that we recognize that potential and we give honor to the parents and the families and the communities who have supported that through this proclamation. Now students, I'm gonna say your names and I might not get them all correct. I am apologizing up front and especially to the parents, okay? Here's our proclamation. Whereas, the Illinois Music Association, I-L-M-E-A, is a not-for-profit professional association representing every level of music education in every discipline and exists to advocate for universal access to comprehensive music education, deliver ex exemplary professional development for educators, 
and provide outstanding musical experiences for all Illinois learners facilitated by licensed music educators. And whereas the ILMEA Elementary and Junior High Division held its annual District 1 Music Festival on Saturday, November 9, 2019 at Joliet Central High School in Joliet, Illinois, which recognized middle school students from more than 60 schools throughout the southwestern metropolitan Chicago for their musical accomplishments. And whereas this program encourages excellence on the part of individual students and encourages further music study and artistry, and whereas along with some of the most accomplished student musicians in the region, the following Elmhurst District 205 middle school students were selected to perform in the Junior Festival Band, Orchestra, and Chorus Concert, or Jazz Concert. For Bryan Middle School, there was Will Brick on the trumpet for the Jazz Band, Nora Conroy, Viola Orchestra, Nathan Darkia, Trombone Band, Aiden Espinoza, Tenor Chorus, Lillian, Liliana Galarza, Alto Chorus, Wade Klinger, Trumpet Band, Kate Truppa, Drum Set, Jazz Band, Betsy Kungo, Alto Chorus, Kara Lazar, Soprano Chorus, Matthew Markwald, Trumpet Band, Margaret Meston, Violin Orchestra, Mac Olson, Trumpet Jazz Band and Band, Tessa Schultz, Soprano and Chorus. For Churchville Middle School, there was Lauren Capuna, Cello Orchestra, Elisa Hall, Alto Chorus, Andrea Luna, Flute Band, Isabella Nichols, Electric Bass, Jazz Band, and Double Bass Orchestra, Audrey Ofusa, Cello and Orchestra. For Sandberg Middle School, there's Bobby Burner, Double Bass Orchestra, Noah Choi, Violin Orchestra, Julian Dominguez, Tenor Sax Band, Clara Johnson, Violin Orchestra, Beth Basilius Malamus, wow, and he's even got a difficult instrument, Euphonium Band, Katie O'Connor, Double Bass Orchestra, Chloe Piot, Violin Orchestra, Joe Pickens, Cello Orchestra, Julius Sparacino, Cello Orchestra, and Montage Ubi, Cello Orchestra. Whereas these accomplishments bring pride and prestige to the family, to Bryan, Churchville, and Sandburg Middle School, to District 205, and to the community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education and Administration of Elmhurst Community Unit School District 205 express congratulations to these students, their parents, and District 205 band, orchestra, and choir directors, and teachers from Bryan Middle School, Churchville Middle School, and Sandburg Middle School. Specifically, Cassandra Deck, Cynthia Cross, Lindsay Sicklinger, Brian Berg, Jessica Tatavolsian, Ellen Gary, Ricardo Vasquez, Heather Knight, John Gaunt, Matthew Cotton, and District Fine Art Coordinator Patrick Baker. Congratulations, students. All right, so now this is a process. I'm going to have you each come up here. You're going to get you're going to get a certificate and shake my hand and then you're going to walk around and shake everyone's hand <laughs> on the cabinet. All right. So a lot of handshaking. Be prepared. Congratulations. <laughs>
Okay, thank you again to all of those students and families. Well done. Oh my, that was pretty impressive. <laughs> um, next, we have two Shining Star recipients to be honored. So I think our secretary, Karen Stufen, is going to honor them. She'll call up the first one. I don't have that. Okay, got it. Jan Dolan. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I'll reiterate what Margaret said. Uh, recognition is the best part of this volunteer commitment. Um, and as even though we really like to recognize the students, we know that you're all behind them and our staff. And so it's equally um, rewarding for us to recognize our staff. So Jan, thank you. And Jan Dolan, Technology Support District-wide, was nominated by Jen Levin, uh, Lieben, who is a teacher at Sandberg. So Jan consistently goes abo above and beyond for the staff at Sandberg Middle School when technology support is needed. Not only will she investigate to determine the underlying causes of the technical difficulties, she will do everything within her power to remedy it, and more importantly, follow up afterwards to ensure that all equipment and services are up and running correctly. Jan is a valuable staff member in District 205 because of her commitment to quality. Her customer service skills are second to none. She understands and empathizes with staff when in panic mode <laughs> with technology. Her amazing attitude helps to create a positive culture when she visits the school. She empowers teachers to be innovative and try new things in the classroom. Jan certainly fits the description of a shining star. So congratulations, Jan. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we have another shining star, Ishmael Zamora, math department head at York. He was nominated by Shalene Delockery, recently an Emerson fifth grade boy, we'll call him John, went to an orientation at York with his older sister. When they went to Mr. Zamora's session, John was so inspired by Mr. Zamora, he started quoting him at his school. John told his peers, quote, if you're not struggling, you're not learning, end quote. 
John went on to receive a positive phone call referral from his classroom teacher because he had been working so much harder since hearing Mr. Zamora speak. When Mrs. Delacry, who is the Emerson School principal, called John's mom for the positive phone call referral, she told, the mom told Mrs. Delacry about this inspiring teacher and that John uh, kept talking about him. She went on to say that they are all so grateful and excited to see John flourish, especially since listening to Mr. Zamora. John has been working much harder and was smiling ear to ear when he received his positive phone call. John said the teacher, Mr. Zamora, he listened to uh, just seemed cool and um, John really liked your message. So thank you, Mr. Zamora, for not only inspiring your own students in, at York in, in math, but their younger siblings who come <laughs> to visit as well. Okay, uh, next on the agenda is public comments. The board will receive public comments for up to three minutes concerning items on this agenda, as well as communication, petitions, reports from citizens, or representatives of other public agencies. Um, I have two names on the list. When I call your name, come up to the podium. Uh, we have a timer that will go off at three minutes, and when it uh, buzzes, we ask that you wrap up your comments then. So first on the list is Marsha Frank. Good evening. Um, first, I do want to take a minute to uh, thank the school board members for their service. As a former member of the Oak Park District 97 School Board, I can appreciate the time and the dedication that you provide for the schools, which helps make the education system in Elmhurst a thriving place to learn. Um, my husband did ask if I was going to have flashbacks coming here, but <laughs> I should have known. Um, I do come to you with what may seem to be a trivial issue, but I assure you it's not. Um, I'm sure that all of us have either sung in the shower or have enjoyed an impromptu concert by a family member in the shower. Um, we all know the wonderful acoustics that are provided by the surrounding tile which helps the voice carry. As a neighbor, a new neighbor to Hawthorne School, uh, we are experiencing the same phenomena. There is an HVAC unit located on the roof of the gym on the west side of the building. This unit is surrounded by three half walls of brick and one full wall of brick. All, um, they're all made of brick. As a result of the location and what appears to be a lack of sound absorbing materials, the neighbors of Hawthorne can hear the unit operating, often at decibel levels that are disruptive, especially in the middle of the night. The unit tends to operate, and I've timed it, <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes, and then it abruptly shuts off for about five minutes and then starts the cycle again. We began hearing the noise in October and thought it might be related to the construction that was occurring at Immaculate Conception. However, that project finished, the noise just seemed to grow in frequency and intensity, especially in the middle of the night. So finally, after weeks of lying awake, usually from 2 to 4 a.m. Uh, onward, I began to search for the sound, source of the sound and finally located it at Hawthorne. On December 17th, I wrote an email to Dr. Moyer, Ms. Cafario, uh, Mr. Riordan, uh, Mr. Schmidt, Ms. Harrell, and Mr. Hostler about this issue. In uh, 24 hours, did not hear from anybody. So I responded again on the 18th, um, just to make sure that the email was received. And uh, I got a curt reply that said, we discussed this matter at Cabinet at 9 a.m. yesterday morning with my facilities person and communications person are looking into the matter. Thank you. That was about a month ago. Have not heard anything since. To date, um, I did several unscientific measures of decibel levels on using just an app on my cell phone. 
December 31st at 4.30 p.m., I measured a rough estimate of 58 decibels, which amazingly dropped to 44 decibels as soon as that cycle stopped. And then on January 4th at 2.30 p.m., I got a decibel level of 67. Now this is, again, it's an unscientific one. It's standing on the, play, the, on the playground, not up at the level. So these results suggest that the HVAC unit might be exceeding the noise limits established by the Elmhurst Municipal Code. While I understand it requires extra expense, and I'm wrapping up, um, to incorporate sound reduction technology into air handlers' uh, de design configurations, it's vital that you do this to your school building as it's located in a residential neighborhood. While we will do what we can to support you, including referendums for construction and other educational projects, it's vital that you support your neighbors as well. I'll be happy to work with you in any effort to expedite the remediation of this issue because we all would like to sleep through the night. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Ava Uditsky and is it Ethan Thomas? Okay. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Ava and this is Ethan. I'm a junior at York and Ethan's a senior. Um, and we're just here to talk to you tonight about the importance of um, green technology and going green in the buildings um, and the new construction projects that are going to be um, being bid on around this time. Um, I just wanted to bring up the importance of using LED lights, um, transitioning to um, reusables in the lunchroom and solar panels in the new construction buildings. While we do understand that this might take um, a little bit more money in the short run, we feel that it's important considering the impacts that climate change are having on our environment um, to make sure that our projects are sustainable and, um, and viable for our long-term health. In addition, uh, the referendum that was passed in 2018 uh, by the district that allowed for the construction of two new schools, we believe that by using some of these uh, green new uh, energy policies that in the long term the district will be able to save money in terms of energy efficiency and the use of classroom space and also uh, LED lights and some of those different uh, options that the district has in front of them. So we're encouraging the district to look into the uh, cost efficiency of some of those those different uh, policies to see if, you know, on the long term, 10, 20 years down the line, whether or not those will make significant impacts because we believe they will and that not only will that help uh, the environment, which is, of course, a significant issue of our time, but that will also benefit the district because they will then be able to use that money and invest it back into the education of the young pupils who will then be growing up in the district at that time. So we encourage you to continue looking into that, and we look forward to hearing uh, what bids are made on uh, some of the new construction as well as the two new buildings, which will uh, be in the works over the next couple years. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you. Any other um, public comments? Okay, at this time, the board does not respond to public comments. Uh, we usually uh, respond via email or reach out to people who speak. Okay, next on the agenda is this uh, reports and presentations. First one is the annual audit review. We have Andy Mace here tonight from uh, Klein Hall, our auditors. Uh, this is the uh, June 30, 2019 um, audit report. Thanks. Formerly Klein Hall. Um, we conducted our audit as Klein Hall, but we're now Withley. We merged with the uh, national firm Withley as of November 1st, and we're real excited about that. It brings a lot of additional resources to us. Um, but the level of service we provide you should remain unchanged. Um, so this is your comprehensive annual financial report for the year ended June 30, 2019. And I, I say this every year, but I kind of like to repeat it. Um, comprehensive annual financial report means that the district goes to the extra effort of um, adding the introductory section and the statistical section. Introductory section talks about what's going on in the district, initiatives, uh, controls, that sort of thing. The statistical section has a whole slew of mostly 10-year historical data um, and relevant demographic information. 
And then the district um, pre, or submits the audit report to the uh, Association of School Business Officials International Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting Program. And they have been a report winner, an award winner for many, many years. I would anticipate that this one would win again. So what that means, though, really, is that the district is employing the absolute best practice of external financial reporting. It doesn't get any better than that. <clears throat> These are rather lengthy reports. I don't want to go through the whole thing, but I'll mention a few things. I always like to talk about our audit opinion on page one. Here we state that we conducted our audit in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards as well as government auditing standards because you receive federal funds and that it is our opinion that these financial statements are presented fairly in conformity with generally accepted accounting principles. So that's a big mouthful, but what that means is it's, it's a clean audit opinion. You know, probably two-thirds to 75% of the districts in Illinois don't get a clean audit opinion. They're qualified usually for cash basis reporting or something like that. Uh, District 205 does not do that. Um, pages 3 to 12, then, is the management's discussion and analysis. As the name implies, this is prepared by the administration. If you didn't read any further than the first couple of pages of this, you'll have a fairly good understanding of what happened financially to the district during the year. Pages 13 and 14 are the entity-wide statements, and I don't like to spend a lot of time there because um, that's not the way you operate. It's not the way you budget. Um, but the, the entity-wide statements compresses everything into one column, essentially, and includes all long-term assets and liabilities. Um, page 15, then, begin the fund financial statements. And page 15 is the, the balance sheet for the district. And the thing to note here is this is where it's evident that the district is deferring that first installment of the, the property taxes. Um, I'm sorry, the, the second installment. You're not deferring the first installment. But the district's policy has been to recognize 50% of the prior year levy in the current year. And um, that's common practice. Some districts defer that first installment to the next year. Um, and that's a discussion that I, I think may be ongoing. Page 17 is the operating statement. And this shows uh, revenues and expenditures for the year and ending fund balance. You see the ending fund balances uh, for your general fund, and that includes your ad, O&M, working cash, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, tort. And your fund balance here is about $61 million. It's roughly 50% of your annual fund balance once you back out the on behalf payment. This year's on behalf payment was recognized at $28 million. So in theory, that's the amount that the state kicks in to TR TRS and THIS on behalf of the district. We're required to recognize that as both a revenue and expenditure. So it doesn't affect your bottom line but it grosses up your numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that's also the reason why you had a budget variance in the general fund, because we never know what to budget for that number. And then the manner in which that amount was calculated this year had changed. So there was, there was a larger budget variance there than normal. Um, after that, then, are the notes of the financial statements, and here we discuss the significant accounting policies and how you recognize things. Um, page 30 and 31 talks about the district's cash and investments. The bottom line there is all your deposits with financial institutions were either insured through the FDIC or covered with excess uh, depository insurance. Page 33 is a summary of the district's long-term debt. Uh, you paid down about $8.7 million related to your bonds during the year. And those are all due to retire by 2027-28. Um, we also see what the liabilities are related to TRS, IMRF, THIS, and the district's OPEP plan are there. Um, skipping ahead to page 38, this is the one that has what I kind of see as sticker shock. The liability, the net pension liability related to TRS, 
The district's share of that is about $6.8 billion. The state's share of district's 205, District 205 liability is $466 million. So these are obviously very, very large numbers. The next one is IMRF on page uh, 44. We see the IMRF net pension liability. At the end of the year, it was about $11.7 million. It had gone up some $10 million. The main driver for that is if you, I don't know if you're looking at your, your audits, but right in the middle of that, because there was a market downturn at December of 2018, that's the measurement date for IMRF, you ended up having negative investment income for the year because of that downturn. Um, <clears throat> that swung you by about $10 million from the prior year. Um, obviously, in 2019, the market was strong, so I would not anticipate uh, next year's report to show such a large liability if it was in the range of where they, uh, uh, where the actuaries peg their investment income to be, uh, all else being the same, I would think your liability would go down by six, seven million dollars for next year. <clears throat> Page 47 then is the net other post-employment benefit obligation related to the teacher's health insurance security fund. And here, these numbers are, are eye-popping as well. Um, the district's proportionate share of this liability is $69.5 million. The state's share of your liability is $93.3 billion. Those are big numbers, too. Um, this one worries me a little more. You know, I know there's a lot of talk about pushing the pension costs back on the districts. Um, to me, this one almost seems like a good candidate. Now, I haven't heard anything like that, but um, the state is not funding this at all. It's all pay as you go. Um, so that, that one worries me. I, I would look out for that one. Um, then the district also has another post-employment benefit plan, and its liability is shown on page 52 of some $12 million. Um, page 54 is, there's a little synopsis of your, your self-insurance for your health care. Um, it shows the year-end liability, and this does not show what your estimated fund balance is at June 30, and that's about $7.5 million. And I was talking with the administration. There is a, that $7.5 million is sitting in your ed fund in this report right now. I think you, you're shown that separately for your internal board reports and all that. But there is a way for us to show that separately in the audit report. So we may, you know, we might consider wanting to do that for next year. Um, the rest of the report then shows the combining and individual fund statements. There's budgetary to actual comparisons made in the, there. And as I said before, there was a budget variance related to the TRS on behalf payment, but otherwise you're right on budget. So that tells me that you, know, you set out a financial plan and you stick to it. And, um, and your fund balances are in good shape because of that. And you know, you, there's a lot of reasons to maintain fund balance, in my opinion. You know, one simply for cash flow purposes because your big influxes of, of tax money come just twice a year. Um, two is for any capital needs that you may have that um, perhaps you don't have referendum money for that, that arise. And thirdly, you never know what kind of curveball the state's going to throw your way. Um, so it's, it's good to have some, some funds set aside for, for those types of uncertainties. The rest of the report then, um, it, like I said, shows the 10-year historical data. You get a good trend analysis of, of where you've been and maybe where you're headed. And, and that's it. It's a comprehensive report. Um, operationally, the district business office does a great job. You're, you're well staffed. Um, there's an excellent organizational attitude towards um, internal controls. You have the right people in the right places. Um, so we didn't uh, have any operational 
uh, management letter comments. So that's that's a plus. That means you're doing a really good job. So that's about all I had. I, I try to go fast. I know your meetings were long. Do you have any questions for me? I have a few. You, you beat me to my annual question, which is, what is the taxpayer of Illinois uh, contribute to subsidize the, our employees who put uh, about 9.5% of their compensation mm. into the retirement fund? And I believe that answer was an additional $28 million, correct, from the taxpayers. That's what they're telling us. From the income taxpayers of Illinois um, to, to subsidize that. Now, um, you were concerned about uh, a post-employment benefits. Mm -hmm. Go back to what page that's on. 47. 47, thank 47. you. 47. And um, so basically you're afraid that the state, who their proportionate share of that liability is a little over $93 million, could try to push that $93 million back on us. Yeah, that's that's a concern of mine. Yeah, I haven't heard anything like that, but it just seems to me that if the state was going to push things back, this would be a prime candidate. And and that's because it's not uh, protected in the Constitution of Illinois. Is exactly. that correct? Yes, unlike okay. the pensions. Okay, so um, so the state would think that maybe they have some legal footing. Yeah, that's my theory. To do that. All right. <laughs> Um, my, my other question on uh, page, let me get there, for, was it 42, 43, bear with me. Um, yeah, on page 43 and, yeah, I'm, I, just, let me start on page 42. The actuarial assumption of uh, the pension money that's invested by the state is that their investment rate of return is seven and a quarter percent. Yeah. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I go to page 43 and I see what their long term expected real rate of return is on their six different asset classes that they invest this money in. The highest of which. Um, well, the highest in which is 7% of the money is invested in alternative investments that they expect a real rate of return between 3.2 and 8.5%. Um, so, you know, you take the air, you, know, you take a midpoint, that's below 7.25%. 18% of the money is in international equities. They expect 7.25% return on that. But... You know, over a third of the money is in domestic equities. Their long-term expected real rate of return is 7.15%. 28% um, of the money is invested in fixed income. Their long-term expected rate of return is three and three quarters percent. And then uh, in real estate, they have 9%. That expected rate of return is six and a quarter percent. I don't get how you can blend all of those expected real rates of return and come up anywhere near seven and a quarter percent. But yet, that's the assumption they use on page 42 for the whole pool of money. It's a darn good question. Is there is there some magic that the state's got that? There's a uh, there. You're looking at a gross versus net number. So the, on page 42, seven and a quarter is uh, a gross number, and then real rate of return implies uh, above inflation on page 43. So those aren't. They're not apples to apples. Okay, numbers. thank you. Yeah, so you got to add uh, inflation to those. Even at 2% inflation, I'm having a hard time getting to what the state's assumption is. You know, I could check with some colleagues of mine and, and try to get you a better answer on that. All right, I yeah. appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Um, and my final question is... Given all that you know and uh, this different school districts you audit, what would your recommendation to our board be about what percentage of an annual, the annual budget should be uh, kept as a fund reserve? 
I usually use the range, what I call the Goldilocks zone, neither too low or too high in the 25 to 50 percent range. 25 to 50, okay. But there's some debate on how you calculate fund balance, though. You know, you uh, recognize your first installment, so your fund balances may be higher than your, your neighbor who defers that first installment. Um, so you would have to adjust those percentages for that. Another way to look at it would be look at your, your cash balances at year end, and I would say I would be closer to the 50% number if looking just at cash balances. Okay, given the way we recognize revenue yeah. currently. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Is it is it common for school districts to underspend depreciation expense uh, with regards to capex? We underspent by about two and a half million dollars. What do you mean by underspent? You mean to budget or no? Uh, no. If you just if you use depreciation expense as a proxy for you know, the, the rate of decline in your asset base, right? And, and you assume that you want to invest capital to make sure that your assets don't deteriorate. Mm -hmm. That would imply your, your capex should be equal to depreciation. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. A lot of organizations you know, don't actually do that in practice, but yeah. I'm curious, you know, we underspent by two and a half million. I'm curious how that would compare just in your judgment. Yeah, well, there's an anomaly in this year's report. So there was a, an adjustment made to accumulated depreciation related to some cap, capital leases. So that was run through depreciation expense. So if you compare depreciation expense this year to last year, I think it was run in about a million and a half higher. And we would expect that to come down again this year. Okay. Um, so your difference was about two million, you think? It was two and a half two on and page half. 18 here, yeah. Um, is that common for school districts that you audit that their capital, their capital spending is less than depreciation. Well, it's it's not smooth, you know, because you're you'll gear up for a big capital project in a year, and your expenditures will, will peak, and then and then they'll they'll wait in subsequent years. So over time, I think you could see a relationship if you looked long term, but in any given year, it may not align. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Mm -hmm. um, and then with regards to risk around pension shift that's been discussed a little bit, um, I was hoping you went into detail in the report just on the amounts and over what time frame um, the phasing could be. And I thought it would be helpful just to give a quick overview of that. Um, it's one of the larger risks to our financial position. So, What page was that on this? Um, I don't recall what page. I just know that I read it somewhere. <laughs> Where the numbers are? The TRS numbers on page 38. And so I was referring to, you know, the I think our current estimate is a four and a half million dollar per annum effect, to the extent that pension shift uh, that's been discussed were actually implemented. Um, and I just thought it'd be helpful to identify that number, which I guess I just did. So, <laughs> okay. so you can ignore my question. Yeah. Um, and then last question for me is just on on fund balance. You kind of laid out a recommended range. How do we compare to our peers currently on that metric? Um, a little better. Yeah, I mean, you guys are in good shape compared to a lot of your peers. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Chris, you bring up a good point about the pension shift. Um, and to your knowledge, it seems like the uh, the pension shift was the last governor's solution to uh, the state's pension crisis. Um, the current governor's solution is a constitutional amendment to increase income taxes. Um, is pension shift still um, still on the table? 
I, I don't, I haven't heard a lot about it lately, but the administration know much more about that. Um, I hear grumblings from time to time, but I haven't heard anything specific. Here's what I've heard, and I, I've heard that this administration um, has tended not to, uh, they move quickly once they decide to move. And they don't always vet everything through normal processes that people were used to, so stuff seems to just kind of appear quickly and then get voted on. And so, Chris, you hear as much as I do, so correct me if you think I'm uh, out of line here, but they want to do something to get the income tax through that somehow or another gives political cover or makes it more palatable through um, property tax freeze or forcing districts to spend down fund balance or something with pensions. And I don't know that anybody knows exactly what's going to happen because the latest that I heard is that um, they're kind of doing some negotiating sort of back channel stuff around the property tax task force report. They're there's a report and then there's other stuff that they're doing and people are not sure what's going to happen. Do you, is that, I mean. Yeah, every, everything is speculation. I mean, we're certainly talking about it or I hear about it at the LEND meetings that there's a lot of speculation. It, it seems like at the LEND meetings there is definitely concern um, about a pension cost shift. I just want to make sure I'm losing sleep over the right subjects. I would add from a lend, lend representative standpoint is PEG actually has subcommittees this year and pension cost shift is one of them. And so, I mean, I think that it's going to be a lot of things happening and I think that they're not taking anything off the table. Um, I mean, they're aggressive in every area. And so I have questions when I can ask questions. To answer you, Jim, is, I mean, we need to seriously accommodate for that and not think that it's not happening. And I did want to just um, add on to your comment about the district's financial reporting being in good shape. And just in my experience looking at financial statements, I thought that I was very impressed with what the district does. So thank you for, for that. And I, I know you guys will keep it up in the future as well. Thanks. Uh, thank you. And I want to give credit to my, my team. Adrian Garrelin has been in the business office for over 30 years. Uh, she's given me notice she's going to retire in October of 21. So I'm very... <laughs> Uh, I'm definitely worried about the October of 21. I know Andy's known Adrian for a, a I long time. I did your audit 30 years ago, <laughs> and I knew Adrian and then. Our Adrian, kids were the same age. And and Adrian supervises a fantastic team with with um, Sharda and Marissa in payroll, Annette in accounts payable, Laura Pishker is our our bookkeeper, and um, they do a great job. Uh, Andy's team requires uh, they. They provide a list of things, and it's like two piles of, of documents in May, and then he comes back, his team comes back in September and gives us another list, and it, there's just an incredible amount of documents that, that the business office team puts together, and they deserve a lot of credit um, for, for the, the annual audit. Absolutely. You know, they do a great job. They get us everything we need. We can... They're, you know, we do our audit in a timely fashion. It's organized. Uh, they know what they're doing. It's it's nice. Not all districts are operated as as efficiently. Uh, Jim, thanks for highlighting the pages 38, 37, 48, whatever. I guess what I wanted to reiterate and take from Jim's part of the conversation is the fund balance. And I know that in previous years, and specifically last year, um, you had highlighted that um, 
that we should be considering our fund balances or your suggestion from your expertise working with lots of different districts um, that it should be closer to 50 percent you reiterated again this point i know that we still have a finance committee um, and we had talked about it last year about revisiting what our what our fund balance minimum should be i guess i'm going to put that out there again um, considering not just the pension cost shift um, but also the new item of the post uh, post employment benefits um, I know that it's a smaller number <laughs> 93 um, well your share is actually for, larger correct yeah. correct but it's a lot smaller number than that pension cost shift yeah. um, so I don't want us to think just because it's a smaller number than the pension cost shift that the, uh, that we don't consider how that might impact us as well yeah, our budgeting and, I, and our allocating about how much we need to keep and, and protect so that we don't go back into the red, which is where we were nine years ago before mm -hmm. I got on the board. Yeah, and your fund balance includes that amount of um, health insurance reserve balances as well. That's why I was mentioning we could break that out for you in this audit report. Um, so that's a little clearer. So that kind of inflates your available fund balance a little bit. And I, di I did invite Andy to come to the February 3rd Finance Committee. Thank you very much. And, and not only thank you for all that you do, all of you, but also the presentation. Hi, you know, what you highlight is really helpful. Oh, um, good. Hasn't always been that way, and so thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thanks for getting me on early and have a good night. All right. It's barely eight o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, next we have the technology committee update. Uh, David Smith and Scott Grins. See how I did that? He just left. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't Dave. That's right by him. So while we're getting set up, I'll just um, get us started off a little bit. Um, <clears throat> thanks for, for having us and giving us a space to talk about <clears throat> some of the work so far. We, in all admittance, have only met four times so far this year. Um, the committee started uh, a Three. year ago. Three times. Three. Fourth one coming up in January. Um, so we're going to try to give you a snapshot of um, some of the progress to date. It's definitely a work in progress in many ways. Um, so just wanted to sort of preface that before we, we jump in. So thanks. Um, our learning and teaching priorities, you've seen these before. And one of the things that we established early on with the tech committee this year um, was a realization that we needed to really hone in on the instructional strategies and make sure that we created outcomes at the beginning of some of our sessions. We also created norms like any good PLC. Um, to share those, I think it's kind of interesting to hear what we came up with. Um, the first norm starts with a T, it's together. We talk about all students in all grades. The second is everyone, and that's everyone is productive and positive. And the third is communicate solutions. And the fourth is have follow through and feedback. And if you're following along, it spells tech. <laughs> um, so I thought that was, I mean, that was That's the first brilliant. meeting. I mean, there was, it was, it was just, you could tell the brilliance was everywhere. <laughs> um, but it was great to engage the team and to hear folks really try to come up with a holistic idea of what it is that we wanted to accomplish for the year. So this is uh, the list of the folks that have been actively participating in the uh, committee, and I want to thank everybody involved. I think uh, there's 40-something names up there right now, or 30-something, but there, there are actually 50 uh, folks that have uh, been in communication with us. Um, um, these folks volunteer their time. It's after school. Uh, and not only that, but they spend time um, outside of the committee meetings, um, getting together in subgroups, uh, communicating with each other, sharing, working on uh, um, projects and Google Docs and artifacts. You'll see some examples later. So this isn't just meeting once a month for an hour and a half. This is work going on. Actually, most of the work occurs outside of the meetings. So I want to acknowledge and thank everybody. Um, the representation is reasonably well uh, distributed. We have five from the uh, either the district uh, level or board. Um, 
Karen Stufen's on our uh, committee. Um, there are seven folks who are located at York High School, um, six from the middle schools, and uh, 18 from the elementary schools. So. And uh, just a quick view into uh, what it looks like when we get together. Uh, we are very grateful to be able to, uh, to meet at the York Incubator Lab. It's an awesome space. Um, it uh, allows the team to uh, actually use and um, get some insights into what some um, new ways to collaborate and use technology uh, as a team. And um, it, uh, I think it also gives some of the teachers and others, other people on the committee an opportunity to kind of think about what it might look like in a classroom um, in the, going forward. So I think it's a great experience. And I actually would like to, again, thank the foundation for supporting that, uh, that endeavor because it's a great place to meet. And I, it, it's, uh, you can see that the picture here, there's subgroups meeting and talking and interacting. And this was not a setup shot. This is really um, work going on, so actively. Yep. I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll be in trouble because there are uh, two drinks in the lab. Oh, yes. And we were told that if we were going to use it, uh, we had to keep beverages out of there. So we should have Photoshopped those uh, in some way or another. It's like being back in the, the living room of your house growing up. Uh, so our district vision, you have seen this and hopefully uh, feel the, the living, breathing document that it has become. And what's really nice about this committee is that we do have representation, as Dave highlighted, from all three strands of our um, supports, district level, school level. And um, what's really exciting coming up related to sort of the classroom element, and you'll hear more about it, but we're going to have some of the teachers that are engaging with some learning activities related to the six C's actually connect with the tech committee at our upcoming January meeting. So I'll share a little bit more about that in a meeting. In a, in a minute, sorry. <clears throat> so um, just to review quickly, uh, last year, this is sort of the setup and, the, and framing the committee for this year was um, the committee that, that formed uh, for the first time in a long time last year, and, and Mark Cohen was um, co-led that with me, and we did some awesome work. We um, actually took a little bit of time to kind of catch the current state of technology in Elmhurst, uh, where we are today. Um, and then we spent quite a bit of time envisioning what it might look like going forward. Uh, we we asked, the, asked the teachers and administrators to imagine what it would be like if really they could, the, the learning environments could be how they would like them to be and try not to think of too many constraints and things that would get in the way, but help us understand what would it look like in, in their ideal world. And so those ideas were captured. Um, we also uh, did cross-check uh, some, some um, some frameworks like the um, ISTE standards for um, students and educators and administrators and tried to look at how uh, those relate to the six C's and some of the work that we're doing in Elmhurst. How do they relate to each other and how do they fit together? So um, we spent time on that and ended up with, uh, you, as you saw last year, it's still posted on the, the website, the instructional technology plan that was put together last year. That's viewed as a living document. It's not meant to be. Uh, historical reference. We are review, uh, referring to that uh, regularly, and we uh, one of the outcomes um, for this uh, committee this year will be to revise that and report back to you later in the school year. So, um, but that maps out a little bit about some ideas about how to get there, how to get to that to that vision. And um, as you might imagine, it's not a one or two step process. It's probably going to take you know a long time, and we'll be um, moving through this over time and updating that document as a group. Um, the areas that highlighted in green are what we are focusing on in this year's committee, and so we'll be talking about uh, and showing you examples and discussing those in greater detail today. Um, I did want to point out that on the hardware and devices, it has to do more with the learning environments, not so much the infrastructure. The infrastructure work is a little bit more mundane, and we work on that on a regular basis. But this is working with teachers and educators on what do we, what do we need to do in the learning environments, and that's um, what, what, learn, what technology is going to help advance uh, student learning. So. So <clears throat> we are trying to stay focused within the operational plan as well. and. With that said, um, a lot of the work is focused around how we can be creative as a committee, but also how we can make sure that whatever the outcomes are from the committee work, that they are also focusing in on what we call Quad D. And to do that, and again, we're going to fly through this slide, but we'll give you much more depth here in a minute with some actual snapshots. 
Um, but when we look at actual tech learning and things related to, you know, whether it be a D205 university course or not, we are trying to make sure that the six C's shine throughout. Um, looking at professional learning and um, with technology that David just mentioned, things like the display pilot and seeing how it is that we can plan that out um, so that it's rolled out seamlessly and so that staff are supported with the new uh, resources as well. We're also looking at um, the six C's and the rigor and relevance framework when we consider digital resources. And this committee has done a great job in a short amount of time to make that process um, more seamless as well, which again, we will show you in just a minute here. So this slide has a little bit more bulk for you. And really what we have been trying to do this year is take the work from 1819, as David mentioned, with the thanks to Dr. Cohen and his work together as well, and just continue to build off on that. So um, in 1819, three things were highlighted, professional learning, digital resources, and then the hardware and devices. And related to professional learning, we captured that around the focus of people. So the committee of roughly 45, 50 folks have been divided up into three different subcommittees, completely by choice. There was the occasional elbow um, when we needed it, but mostly everyone is where they really want to be focusing. And one of the outcomes from the people subcommittee to date has been the D205 course called Build Your EdTech Foundation. We're going to show you a little more on that in a second. That's been more of a short-term conversation and really trying to figure out what we can do in a short amount of time this year to make sure that EdTech is um, you know, getting into the classrooms and getting into our students' learning. More long-term, our next step is to start to think about systematically what can we do to really make sure that this is uh, targeted and it's intentional with um, things like needs and time and people. Um, related to that is opportunities to embed technology in a more systematic approach. So looking at things like our curriculum development process and seeing if someone is proposing a new course, are we asking how is tech going to be integrated into that course? So finding ways and um, the existing structures to make sure that tech is highlighted and also focused in and aligned to the six season the rigor and relevance framework on a related note um, within our, our second subcommittee is the process group so they're looking at um, digital resources and um, access to those one of those specific items is a digital citizenship curriculum and this work um, is really coming from again is is dave highlighted a minute ago the passion of a lot of the committee members we have folks on the committee who've written um, you know, sort of initial white papers on this work. There's been some research work done on it. There's been some um, master's level and, you know, sort of doctoral level work. So they really are bringing a lot to the conversation. And again, this is work in progress. So when we say digital citizenship, um, that could be focusing in developing some way of having um, something like a digital footprint uh, lesson plan or unit that exists that isn't um, sort of standalone, but might take place um, with various staff in the building or at a certain grade level. So just to give you an example of what that means. So at the third grade, and the concept of digital footprint and identity, um, they could be asking and students could be looking at an essential question around, how does what I post online affect my identity? And that same content area, 10th grade, a good example of the same exact focus with digital footprint, how can I create a social media presence that represents the real me? So these are really um, hot topics that are relevant today and um, they exist in many ways in what we're doing. We're just trying to organize the work and make sure that it's done um, seamlessly. There's a lot of free resources around that, which is another thing that the committee takes into consideration. There's a great program through what's called Common Sense Media um, that is being currently reviewed and considered for um, parts and pieces that we could maybe bite off. Um, continuing with the process team, uh, one of the areas that I've been um, connecting in with is to help with the process of um, identifying and approving and uh, also communicating and uh, sharing with uh, staff digital resources that are available that have already, you know, vetted by the district, uh, vetted by the, either the learning and teaching uh, uh, department and have been paid for in their subscriptions or possibly just uh, free resources or resources that teachers come across in uh, their, their networks and their uh, various um, conferences and things they may attend so but we we need we are working on a process that formalizes how that how that flows through the review and approval and and sharing and communicating with people so that it's not as 
um, hit or miss. Right now, admittedly, there are a few different lists of things, um, a few different places that people can go to look, and there's also more than one way that people might ask for um, somebody to review that work, or those pieces. So we're trying to define that and be clear. I think part of the part of the issue uh, we're having with our uh, district is just a little bit of uncertainty about how that process um, looks today. So we're trying to define that and and be more crystal clear about that. Um, and then uh, the, la the last sort of uh, third uh, piece is the product, which is, uh, the, again, devices and hardware, um, or also known maybe as the tech roadmap, the, uh, especially re related to instructional technology in particular. Like I said, not so much the infrastructure, but um, the classroom um, technology to help learning. Uh, what we're focusing on this year pretty heavily is the, um, the K-5 classroom pilot, which started this year. It's been ongoing. Um, it's going to help inform the decisions and recommendations that we'll make later in the spring. You'll hear more about in terms of upgrading, well, like for example, even in this boardroom here, um, you know, being able to have clearer, brighter um, um, displays that can be connected wirelessly and so on. So we'd like our classrooms to have uh, tech, uh, tools like that that, en that enable um, you know, communication and sharing and collaborating. Um, or the incubator lab is that other example where you saw hu people huddling around different areas and working together and being able to share. That's the kind of concept that we're uh, exploring this year and trying to come up with an answer that's going to um, benefit the children in uh, the elementary level. Uh, we're beginning to have conversations about what would it look like in, in the upper grade levels from 6 to 12. Uh, there'll be a needs assessment that we're working on. Uh, it's uh, actually it's already started in the subcommittee, uh, in, uh, an initial uh, draft of some um, questions to ask teachers at those levels to try to get some input, and we're going to develop that this year and try to collect some input this year that would help define what we even want to try next year in grades 6 to 12. So we're looking to repeat and it may be a different way, but a similar approach in 6 to 12 that we're taking in K-5 where we'll bring some technology in, we'll have teachers try it, we'll ask them what's working for them, what, what maybe doesn't work so well, and try to, try to have an informed um, decision going forward. So that activity is going on. And then another area is um, we're struggling to what to call it exactly. We're, right now it's called the Tech Educator Support Directory and Forum, or it's been called the Who's Who or the What's What. Um, um, what's that? The who's who? So it's, an, it's actually maybe a few different things, but really what it is is teachers don't necessarily know where to go sometimes to get help or like who, who knows about this uh, particular tool or who, who, can, who can I ask or who, who's willing to help me? That's, that's one thing we want to be able to provide uh, teachers is just a place to go to look to ask. Even post an open question like, hey, has anybody run across this issue before? Or does anybody know how to approach this situation? And then have other people who are voluntarily answering so, those questions. So it's like an open forum, like a bulletin board, um, you know, volunteer, just people helping each other out. Um, another another uh, aspect of this would be just just uh, literally uh, posting and, and uh, um, housing information about the digital resources. That, that might be where the people would go to find the list, those approved lists, and those, those, that's where that stuff can be communicated and, and, and stored and shared. So a place for teachers, like a place for teachers to go where they just know they're going to find answers. So we're working on developing that. And actually, there's, there's um, progress made there that we'll, we'll show you in just a minute. So the D205 University course um, is a relatively new member to the district here. This was a great example and an awakening moment for me about just how powerful the staff is in Elmer's 205. We identified a need for um, some tech integration and some staff learning, and there were um, a handful of folks who just immediately stepped up and um, completely knocked it out of the park. I wanted to print their emails and just read to you like the, the modeling that was taking place. I won't bore you with that, um, but it really was impressive to see the modeling that was going on in terms of their willingness to fail, their willingness to try something new, and their um, complete and utter collaboration. So uh, one person would sort of take an idea and, and just started to build on it, and then folks were just chiming in along the way, digitally connecting on the development of it, and this is the first of its kind blended course attempt. Um, we had a great compliment received as recently as today from a staff member who said, you know, I really appreciate the flexibility of, you know, the administration and the district staff just really opening the doors and letting us sort of play around with this idea and making it work. And I thought that was a really um, great compliment given, you know, the, the, still, the still high level of expectations within the coursework, but also just the, the actual design itself. So the participants in this course are going to have a menu of options that they choose from. 
They can implement grade level technologies related to that. The idea is that they eventually will be building an online um, teacher toolbox. They are also in the same process getting more connected, like David mentioned, with one another. So they're building a little bit of like a local learning network, as they call uh, in some of the, the tech worlds. Um, and I had earlier mentioned that they're going to be connecting with the actual committee. So ironically, they have. Um, coursework evening on the 28th. We have a committee meeting on the 28th. So we're going to take a short amount of time, about 15, 20 minutes, just to connect the two groups, the committee members and the staff members that are learning technology. Um, that's still in the planning phase, but you know, it might be some sort of a sort of just collaboration opportunity to get the folks to, to talk to one another. So um, again, just really impressive to see how quickly something like that can come to fruition um, with, with strong staff and just a, a great focus. Um, just another example. Uh, this is uh, uh, from one of the uh, from the process team that we talked about. Um, just an example. It's a work in progress. Uh, somebody, in, in, uh, it's kind of to Scott's point, quickly put together a prototype or a draft uh, form that teachers could use, and it, re it currently links to or points to some of the uh, other resource lists that we have. This is very much a work in progress. I mean, here we are in January, and we've got a, we've got a long way to go, but we're. The point I think I want to make with this is people, again, people are getting together, they're collaborating, they're sharing, they're working together, and we're trying to come out to an outcome, you know, through this school year that, that would be um, well understood and communicated to staff for where they could, um, um, you know, uh, get answers or get, uh, get information or get things approved. Um, so just another artifact that's actually uh, coming together. <clears throat> the digital resources guide is not new. This was started in the past. Uh, this year we've tried to broadcast this and market it more with the staff. It's a live Google document of about 30, um, some paid, some not paid, but these are subscriptions and purchases that have all been vetted, um, which Dave will talk about more in a minute. What's really neat about this is being a digital Google doc, we can see live when people are in the document. And most of the time during the day, if I open this document, you'll see up top three to four, you know, staff members that are in the document currently using it. So it's affirming to see that, you know, um, that staff members are accessing the tools and utilizing them um, even more. We want to do an even better job of just continuing to market out items like this. Um, this year we, we in person shared this with the staff in the beginning of the year, but we want to make sure that we have touch points throughout the year so that the staff is reminded of it as well. And the last example, uh, <clears throat> this is actually um, a system that we use to do the um, terms of use and student data privacy checks. And so those are, that's another list of uh, various things that we've looked at and approved. Um, they pass, and as you probably hear from the news, that sort of thing is a big deal now, right, with student data privacy and, um, um, you know, trying to protect our, the information. And there's a new law, I think it's called uh, SAPA, Student Online Protection Privacy Protection Act. It's a new law that just took place, started in uh, January 1st, and uh, but districts have until July of 2021 to be fully compliant. But every resource we use has to be um, has to be uh, publicly posted. We have to have the terms of the of the use posted and all the information about how the data is protected has to be available to, to parents. So this would be an example of how that, that could be implemented. And would, but then, admittedly, we have work to do to consolidate our list, pull it together, and again, like I said earlier, kind of make it a place where people can go and find that information. So that, that's more work that's going on with the committee. And just a uh, kind of an update slash review. Uh, this is a, a, a graph that depicts the instructional technology roadmap that we uh, communicated last spring. We're in the 20, obviously we're working on um, the gray, uh, um, what do you want to call that thing, <laughs> the rectangular thing on the left. But on um, the next school year, uh, a couple of key points as uh, we, we plan to have the um, K-5 display upgrades started. It's going to be, I'm certain, a multi-year uh, project, especially with the construction going on and um, the renovations within the classrooms. We probably don't want to go in there and uh, put that effort forward and then have to undo it again. So we'll have to work through a, a phasing of, of these upgrades th uh, throughout K-5, but also later, later years, the um, 6 to 12. And then I um, wanted to point out there is a MLI program. We call it MLI in the past, we, I'm not sure if we're going to rebrand it, but um, the uh, MLI program review was, was, has been hanging there for something that we would want to conduct 
during the next school year. If that's still uh, a priority for the district, then we would put the energy together to, to go through a re review process of where we are with our instructional technology and uh, help inform, again, future um, decisions that are some big decisions need to be made going in forward in the future. And I think the tech committee, tying it to the tech committee, I, I feel like that's a great place to get some energy and some input and resources around uh, working on that uh, review. Um, so it's not defined yet. If we if we do indeed decide to continue with the review next year, we would probably start that conversation in the you know late spring or summer to to build up and have that activity going on during the school year next year. So um, I think we may be at the end of our report. So if there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer. So not so much a question, but just a comment, and it's probably something I know Scott's heard me say before, that um, I appreciate you putting into a policy form a roadmap for teachers and administrators and buildings to follow to get what they need. I think, like you said, there's confusion about how to go about getting what everybody needs, and because there has been no kind of clear directive before now, um, I think people kind of, you know, work the system and, you know, try to find out, get what they want in different ways, which I think leads to inequity. So if somebody knows how to work the system better, they might get more. And so I truly appreciate um, the fact that there's going to be a clear roadmap that everybody will be able to follow and everybody will be able to take those steps to get what they need in their building. So thank you very much for working on that. That's all I want to say. Thank you. All right, I, I've got a question. So can you just refresh my memory when you talk about the display upgrades? Is that, what, what is that entail? <clears throat> well, the need is, is very clear because of the um, projector technology that's in the schools is about 10 years old, plus or minus, right, for the technology we have, similar to our projectors we had here, where they get difficult to see, they, um, and they're not really, uh, you can't really repair them, you have to replace them. So um, I think it's doing a disservice to a lot of our students, it's difficult to see um, some of the, um, what they're sharing with each other. So that, that's the need, and we need to uh, find a way to uh, provide um, newer technologies that are brighter, crisper, but also have other capabilities like wire, uh, you know, wireless connectivity, casting from student devices, so that there can be more collaboration and sharing. It's a much more flexible tool. Um, some of the, um, at K5, we're looking at the ones that also have interaction and other software that goes with that, so it provides a little bit more, so it might be like similar to some of the smart board um, features. Uh, but the, the process is, um, getting some different technologies into the classroom, having some select teachers use those technologies, have, having uh, multiple ses uh, training sessions for them and opportunities to collaborate, and then coming back, we're at planning on um, February, mid-February sessions with those teachers to, to start to collect feedback from them to help inform our decisions. But the rollout um, it isn't defined yet, but we're going to have to define in terms of budget and time and also taking into consideration construction how much, how many rooms we can do per year and have a, have, have a way of marching through that. So um, it will, it's, it's quite a bit of an investment. I think um, we need to make that investment just because of when you go to classrooms, you see that the need is there. Um, it will take some time and some effort to kind of navigate through how that's going to happen. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Or not? There, is there if there's something specific you want to know? So, yes, you did, and then I kind of have a follow-on to what you said. So I guess the one question I have then is, and it sounds like you're starting to address it, but that you know you're not just going to put a dis a display, you know, whatever this I assume that has capabilities that. Um, doesn't come with either training or way for it to truly be utilized because these are very expensive right and by the I mean I look at the timeline and I'm like by the time mm -hmm. by the time we're even potentially towards the end of the upgrade those are already going to be out I mean you know in five years ever I mean um, I'm hoping we'll get 10 years out of them um, but but um, I, I 
to your point about the, the, the supporting the teachers, though, that's critical. And one of the pieces of feedback we're already getting from the pilot teachers is, well, there's a, there's a lot to these things, and we need support. Well, the teachers will need support. Um, we've had the vendors come do multiple training sessions with them. Um, and um, we've had time for them to collaborate, the, the pilot teachers to collaborate amongst themselves and share. And it's pretty clear that um, that you know there, there's there's a lot of features and capabilities uh, that are available that could be beneficial. But if 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 the teachers aren't supported, then really you could you know don't spend that kind of money. You can go simpler, cheaper, and just kind of. You know what I mean? So if you're going to make that investment in the technology, you also need to make the investment in helping the teachers use that. Otherwise, I, I think you're not getting your uh, return on investment. So that, when this is priced out and it's scaled, you know, I would personally like to really know that, you know, what the educational value is. Yes. It's not just, you know, yeah. I, I mean, I, I can see what the general value is, but, you know, that is a huge investment. It's also a space. I mean, it's going to take up space in a lot of our class. I mean, some classrooms are going to be small, and that's big. And, mm -hmm. um, and I guess just making sure that that is the route that is gives the most... I don't know. What, one of the um, yeah, yeah bank what what I'm I've uh, st started to work on. I'm working with some I'm working some with some K five principals on defining um, what questions and what information do we want to hear from do we want to gather from the teachers. And I've, I've touched base with Marianne briefly, and uh, the 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 work that's one of the things that'll be worked on between now and mid February will be the the vehicle to and the question is to ask to to find to gather that sort of what's the value add I mean essentially that's the that's the that's the crux of the the matter right and what if we're going to make that investment and provide a tool like that what does that provide you how does that help students learn that a uh, similar tool like this which is actually not this is not the interactive module this is a static display but like what does this investment in this technology uh, what's the value added that you can't get through a different avenue that that would be a base sort of like a base rollout. So that's I, that's that's the crux of the question. I think is we need to we need to make sure that it's worth it, and that we're not only is it worth it, but we're providing the support as a district to make sure that we're getting that um, use out of it. That's going to get to that higher level. The quad D part the, in the rigor and re relevant frame, relevance framework. If these these technologies don't help the teachers and the students get to that quad D level, then we could probably take a different route and save some money and get it done more quickly. So, yeah. I just had a quick question more generally on D205 University. Do we have information on what proportion of our teachers utilize that resource? Not just for technology, but for the variety of offerings available there? Yeah, give Nikki a minute. Okay. Uh, she's looking it up. Okay. No but, um, but uh, we have been taking a look at D205 University just as an aside to um, we get feedback after every course and we're trying to figure out um, how to make these things as uh, these courses as relevant as possible that support our learning goals. So we have taken a hard look at uh, uh, what the tech needs of our teachers are and, and I think several of our courses are in the process of being revamped or new proposals are um, being solicited for different purposes, but um, we do it in the, in in the summer as well. So, do you have the stuff? Sure. So this spring we wanted to run eleven courses, and we're currently going to run six because we didn't have enough teachers sign up. So we're going to be running an ed, the ed tech one that Scott referred to. We have 26 partic participants in that one. We're going to be running a co-teaching one, which I'm excited about because based off the special education report, that was one of the things that we committed to. We currently have 12 participants for that, but I think we've had a few more sign up since. Our The, the minimum number that we want in a D205 course just to get the return on our investment is 15 members because we do pay our teachers $750 to teach those courses. So if we don't have at least a minimum of 15, we don't really feel as though um, it's enough teachers to run the course. We're also running um, a course called Notice and Note for Nonfiction. So it's how to take notes when you're reading a nonfiction text during the workshop time. We're also running the fiction version of Notice and Note and supporting the needs of all learners, which is an inclusion 
course for some of our related service teachers. And then engagement and cooperative learning. So those are the ones that are running this spring, which I would say, and I don't have this number, don't quote me on it, but I don't think we ran a total of seven courses at all uh, of all of last year. So the fact that we're running seven in the spring is, is a pretty good celebration for the work that Leslie Weber is doing in her new role. And I think it's a great idea, and I'm supportive of, of doing it. I, do we use a third party to to run those for us who would have information on, you know, like our peers, what the participation rate would be for for this? What what what, what credit? What does that go through for credit? So they don't get college credit. They get lane credit in District 205. How does it compare to other districts? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I guess I'm just curious because I don't have a perspective on, they sound like good courses, right? Um, 12 or 15 people sounds low, but I know how it is, right? Like not everybody would need mm -hmm. that. And so I'm just wondering if that, is that a good number? Is that not? And maybe if, if we have somebody who's helping us run the program, if they could maybe provide us with a perspective on what would be typical, you know, for a district our size. At that sure. Point. I would say that the number is lower than the, than we would like, but I also know that Dr. Cohen is in the process of vetting, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but Dr. Cohen is in the process of vetting, you know, is District 205 University, are we getting the bang for the buck? Is that the direction that we want to continue down? If so, how could we get more participation from teachers and run courses that they are asking for and are seeking uh, for their learning, but then if if not, what would that look like moving moving forward? You reference a partnership, and I'll just be brief. Um, because I haven't forgotten my roots last couple of years in technology, we actually are going to be hosting courses through um, the University of St. Francis at Sandberg Middle School starting in the spring semester, summer, fall, and then the spring of 21 um, around technology. So we have courses on foundations of ed tech, collaborative web tools, multimedia tools, assessment, and improving student achievement with technology. Those can be offered through the University of St. Francis and the Regional Office of Education. They're housed here, and the, the courses themselves are offered. Um, so teachers will get college credit. They can transfer anywhere, but also the, for horizontal advancement. And they're offered a substantial discount through the Regional Office of Education's TIDE program. So we are trying to find ways to bring in those third parties to come in and do some of that work with us. Sure, and I also don't want to forget the NIU reading cohort that we're currently offering. We have 30 participants in the district, primarily special ed and EL teachers, that are rece going to receive over a two-year period of time their master's in reading through Northern Illinois, U Northern Illinois University, and that's fully funded through our Title II and through our IDEA grant. Okay. Anything else? Oh, Karen? I just wanted to call out and thank, on behalf of the board, the um, the committee members, um, because as, as Scott had indicated and Dave has indicated, there's a lot of work that's that's done in a short period of time. The District 205 um, University course, and just so that you understand, the committee. I mean, it's really about you know integrating technology, but really, where are we from a end user perspective, which of course is the students, but for us it's the our our employees. And you know, what do they need in order to be more successful? So that's that's really what we, you know, took initially. Um, and they've done a phenomenal job. I mean, I'm in their meeting with them, I'm working with them. And you know, the one thing that I I will um, plug is um, that they can't do it all, right? So we're looking forward to, and you could see in the presentation that it is really looking at system, systemic, how do we embed in technology in everything that we do. Technology, I mean, just based on my background, I mean, that's kind of where we are, um, is it touches everyone for everything, and therefore, how really do we transform the organization in thinking about what elements technology has in everything that we do, and that it comes out in the beginning. And we'll have people, and this is just the way it always is in any organization, is at different levels. And therefore, we need to, from a systematic standpoint, is as we deploy things, whether it be a new initiative, a new uh, course, um, a new math program, whatever, 
you know, what that technology piece is embedded in what we deploy. And we always have to be assessing where are our people, what do they need, and then how do we offer what they need. So I wanted to kind of put the plug in. <laughs> well, thank you for your support as well. We, we both appreciate it. All right, thank you. Okay, next, uh, superintendent's communication facilities update. All right, good evening. So um, the bids have been released and uh, there's a finance committee meeting. It's not listed on here, but it is listed on the board agenda for February 3rd and that will be um, a quick turnaround because the bids don't come in until the previous Friday, but uh, ICI is going to be, is it Friday or Thursday, Chris, when the bids? Friday. Friday. So ICI is going to try to do a quick turnaround for the finance committee to at least uh, be able to give a, a pretty uh, um, uh, reflective overview of the bids that, that met the specs and things like that. And then what we want to be able to do is approve those bids on February 11th. We have uh, an initial planning meeting to get the work off the ground to, uh, and Edison, of course, they break ground in the spring, so there's some immediate stuff that needs to be done there too, so both short and long-term planning uh, that needs to go on. Um, and uh, there'll be various subcommittees associated with that. And I've talked about that before, but that first meeting is January 27th. The February 18th meeting that you see actually got moved up to uh, yesterday. And we talked uh, about um, the timeline for the projects and revising that timeline based on the fact that uh, uh, we, we had more money um, in that first round of bonds. And so uh, we're, the, the main goal there is to move field up. Uh, and we are pretty confident that we'll be able to move the field project up a year. Chris is in the process of working on getting numbers from Elizabeth on, on trying to estimate what we think that next uh, round of bonds might look like. And so that's the, uh, that's the facilities update. The district, uh, the Thrive D205 update, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview and then turn it over to Bev. Um, we uh, have a meeting that's also scheduled for, Janu for January 27th. And the main purpose for that meeting will be for the subcommittees to report out on their work and to go over the WE survey results uh, and talk about the progress on focus groups for the spring and some of the planning that's been going on there. So there'll be a lot, a lot of input that we get. Uh, there'll be regular board reports that continue um, throughout the, the duration of this project uh, to update people. But one thing that we do want to um, uh, highlight is that the 612 homework policy is looking really good and um, we are expecting to be able to share that on February 11th and have that ready for the handbook committee and for approval so that um, uh, there's been good work. It looks, the draft looks excellent. I think people will like it. So that was one of Thrive's primary goals for this year and, and that, will, um, that will occur. So Bev's been doing a lot of work with the thought exchange and the community engagement piece. And so I'm going to turn it over to her and um, I'll let her uh, give you that update. Well, happy New Year to the board. It's been a, it feels like we should have seen each other before now, but we haven't. So I hope you all had a great, great holiday. Looking at community engagement, it's not just my work. I do want to shout out a couple of other people, Learning and Teachings, Leslie Weber, uh, Principal Heidi Thomas, as well as our own Beth Hostler from the board, as well as Dr. Moyer's support to continue moving forward with the board's request and also our desire to 
continue with community engagement, knowing that that's the central piece, really going forward and excavating and getting to what the community values in terms of Thrive Detail 5's focus as it would be upcoming. We promised you that we would be going back out to get additional information over and above the WE survey. We are preparing to launch a thought exchange. Uh, for those who may not know or need a refresher, thought exchange is more than a survey. It really is an idea exchange placed electronically. It operates off of one central basic question. Individuals who are participating in the exchange get to go in and answer that question to their liking, as many thoughts as you would possibly want, and then go on to discover or star other thoughts that are out there from other individuals and say what where their priorities are on that. And at the end, those things add up and come into alignment and you get to see what the top thoughts are coming out of that exchange. In this case, we are centrally focused on Thrive Detail 5. And the central question will be, in spring 2019, we started Thrive D205. What are your thoughts on how we can continue to support our students to overcome stress and achieve a balanced state of well-being? From that question, we wanted to make sure that we put it down to its barest essence. We didn't want any of our own thought exchanges that we have on a daily basis to come forward in this, but to really let that central question be basic and allow the community to take it and go from there. And when we say community, this particular exchange will be devoted toward parents. And we're going EC12 on this particular exchange. Uh, we will launch on Thursday between the three and five o'clock hour. It will operate by an email over school messenger, which is our normal messaging system. It will have a letter from me uh, operating as Elmhurst CUSD 205, and there will be a traditional URL, a traditional link within that email that launches that thought exchange and invites individuals to participate. Once inside the exchange, they will have directions, another informational greeting from us as D205, also an informational video from our superintendent, AKA superstar, Dr. David Moyer, inviting them to participate in the thought exchange. And then you're able to enter. You can choose your language. It's primarily set to English to start, but you can go through Google Translate right there in the, in the platform and choose your language to operate. That, I believe the exchange will be open about 11 days. It's usually recommended somewhere between 10 and 14. That'll be open. We will close it on the 27th at 11.59 p.m. I have no druthers or qualms about what time it should close. I just want people to make sure that they have enough time. I know our last minute folks out there getting home after work, if you haven't participated, you want to get in there, or you say, hey, I want to start something else, you can go back in as many times as you would like to be able to add a thought or to be able to uh, prioritize some thoughts with some extra stars. For those who are participating, it's recommended that you star. You don't have to star everything, but uh, try to give about 20 to 30 stars toward various comments that you see. Your comments are confidential. How you prioritize things, that is also confidential. If you find someone in the thought exchange community that is breaking that rule, you can report it. I'll be behind the scenes and get to see it and say whether that thought should stay there, if it is indeed a violation of what our priorities or our, our rules are for the exchange, and decide whether that thought does remain or whether it gets to be tossed out. So questions from you on Thought Exchange. We're launching on Thursday. <laughs> Um, one question, I'm yes, just going to ask if you wouldn't mind repeating the question sure. that is going to be stated. All right. <clears throat> Let me get my repetition voice on. <clears throat> In spring 2019, we started Thrive D205. What are your thoughts on how we can continue to support our students to overcome stress and achieve a balanced state of well-being? Thank you for repeating that, and I, um, no you know, I just think sometimes it's helpful 
for people who may be watching this later, they can start thinking about that question and, and coming, mm -hmm. um, preparing themselves for ideas. On Thursday, I want to thank the committee for um, bringing this thought exchange to life. I think it's a critical part, as you stated before, getting our community and community values in, behind this Thrive 205 so we know what we're doing uh, is, is what the community wants us to do. Uh, so again, thank you for that, and I look forward to hearing the outcome. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, just one more parting piece. We did launch, pre-launch, and we put out uh, last week, I believe on the 9th, so a week before we're scheduled to launch, a pre-promotional email saying that this is coming, a school messenger a message that said, hey, this is coming, and sort of primes, doesn't use the exact wording for the question, but it'll get you there. So that when you see it, it will not be the first time that you have seen it. And we will continue throughout the process to put out reminders, hey, we still need you to go in and star things, or thank you so much for participating, you still have time, and also remind you when we will actually close it. So there'll be communication with parents ongoing. <coughs> And I, I just want to applaud the open-ended question. <laughs> that was um, tough. Yes. And <laughs> the fact that you highlighted that you are not steering our community towards <laughs> what their answers are. Um, I think that is a huge step in gathering information and getting a true idea of what's important in our community and what their values are that they want represented in this Thrive 205 and other areas. So I, I, I applaud and I'm, I really appreciate you approaching it with this in this way. Well, thank you. It, it took several, several edits to get there. Uh, thought exchange in terms of a tech setup, it's pretty much a no-brainer. It's getting that central thought and how you can really jump off and make sure that you're giving the widest platform you can for responses. Uh, thank you, and I think we're up to Tweet of the Week, which is also you. All right. Waiting from a visual. Okay. All right, Tweet of the Week. As you know, this is our chance to highlight what's happening a little bit on social media from our teacher's perspective, the type of work that's going on. Uh, didn't try to align it with the tech report, but since it was there, you can consider it planned in that way. Um, I often talk about my school days and what wasn't there and what is there now for students. I'm not going to do that tonight and do a flashback. But what I will say is it is amazing how, we, how many ways we can actually get students engaged in the learning process that we may forget that coding involves a lot of math. And so Valerie Baxter, a fourth grade teacher over at Field, does get this shout out today with Tweet of the Week. And she's joking a little bit, she says, I got to guest teach Fraction Circles, one, in my teammate's room. Seriously, just saying, we are going to code, gets kids excited about a math lesson. And I think I would have made it through Fractions a lot easier if we had coding going on back at that time. And of course, our hashtag is always IgniteD205. And shout out to Field and their own Twitter handle at FieldD205. And you can see a couple of other uh, ats there that were addressed in the tweet. But thank you to Valerie for acknowledging and certainly showcasing what it is to teach math today. And yes, it can involve something with technology, but it is also a very deeper lesson on how you can vary things and get to the same end and challenge our students. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, board communications. Board members will present reports or share information with the full board. Does anybody have anything? Okay. Then we have three upcoming meetings scheduled. Uh, Tuesday, January 28th, 2020, regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting here in District 205 Center at 7 o'clock. Monday, February 3rd, 2020, Finance Committee meeting 
here in District 205 Center at 530 and Tuesday, February 11th, 2020, Board of Education meeting here in District 205 Center at 7 o'clock. If there's nothing else, we are adjourned.